All right. So uh, uh, thanks uh, to Zichen for your introduction. And I really uh, thank SIX uh, Singapore in, for inviting me here. So uh, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, there is something wrong with my uh, VPN. So anyway, so let's just get started. So today is the topic is about uh, network analysis with R. And I believe that uh, the organizer has already asked uh, all of our participants to uh, download the uh, the package for network analysis in R Studio, right? The I graph, all right? So uh, let's get started. So this is me, but uh, I won't be introducing me again since uh, Zichan has already done that. And so let's uh, start. So speaking of network analysis, uh, Many of us may think that it's very computational, right? But actually, it is not a very new method. It has been applied in sociology at least since last century, right? I think this is a, uh, a typical example of the um, early stage network analysis research, right? So this is an, uh, a, a figure uh, representing the network relationship in the character uh, club. And even without knowing any you know, background information, simply by looking at this graph, then we can know that you know, there are at least two so-called power centers in this graph, right? Um, like the node 34 and node 1, right? And actually, they are the, uh, the coach and the best player, respectively, all right? So this is the, uh, the use or the application of early stage network analysis to let us understand the so-called social structure surrounding us, all right? And here is another study I found interesting in an uh, uh, WeChat uh, public account article, which basically depicts you know, the uh, communication network of the uh, key politicians around the, uh, the mid Ming dynasty. All right. And simply looking at this graph, then you can know that you know, this one, Zhang Zhujun, this one, the central point, uh, this guy was the prime minister of that time, whereas Where's the emperor? The emperor is here, is at the peripheral, right? So simply at looking at this communication network among these key officials and politicians, then we can sense that we can sense the some kind of power structure of that town, right? That the prime minister might be even more powerful than the emperor at that time. And actually it is, it is the truth, right? So this is the uh, usefulness of network analysis, all right? And, and this is my research, uh, which is, um, I can say, more a bit more computational, right? So this is a research about the, uh, the Twitter network in a, uh, an, a, a movement in Hong Kong, right? So the colored dots means that the, the tweeters that, has, that have been retweeted at least once, whereas, uh, as you may see here, there are even, there are more gray dots Right, these are the tweet tweet the uh, tweet accounts that haven't got any retweet, right? And through this um picture, then we can sense uh who is more likely to be retweeted in the social uh movement, right? So uh, basically, it's those positioning at the peripheral, but in the same time connecting within some communities. For these people, they are their tweets are more easily get retreated in the um, social movement. So this is um, this is part of my research, all right. So um, that's the examples, right? So now let's formally start with the um, this uh, seminar, right? So I will first briefly introduce some basic elements in network analysis in case that some of you might not be familiar with it. And for those of you who are already familiar with these uh, concepts, please bear with me, all right? So let's just go through the basic elements one by one, and then I will start our uh, hands-on uh, practice, okay? All right, so what is a network? So um, conceptually, a network is just a collection of nodes connected by edges. So that's the, the simplest definition of a network, right? So notice that there are two elements. The first one is nodes, and inside area is also called vertices, right? And the other element is edges. In some area, it, they are also called ties or links, but they are the same, they are the same thing, right? So um, the 
uh, visual representation, which means the graph. I think it's the most common way, uh, that the most uh, common representation that we use to indicate a network, right? And, but please notice that there are also other ways of representation of a network. For example, we can also denote a network by set notation, right? So the same as the uh, definition. So here a network G is just a set of, you know, vertices, which means nodes plus a set of edges, right? And we have a node set and an edge set. So for this uh, kind of representation, usually we use it when we need to write the coding, we need to write, uh, add some nodes or uh, add some edges. So that's that's when that's where we need to uh, denote the networks by set notations. And we can also uh, represent a network by matrix, all right? So this is a typical so-called adjacency matrix in which uh, for nodes that have a connection between them, then we denote the cell as one. For example, node A has a connection with B. So, you know, the, uh, the cells of A and B is denoted as one. And since it is an undirected network, right? That means there is no direction among the edges. The, this adjacency matrix is symmetrical, right? All right, so these are the three uh, common ways to kind of denote a network. And notice that for most of our network computation, it is actually done by matrix computation. All right, so that's uh, that's it. And then um, we also have direct network, which means that the there is direction among the um the ties, right? So for example, if C follows E and E follows C, right, that's two types, right? Direct network, and apart from these three ways of representation, we can also denote a network by edges, right? So edges here means uh, we are recording the, uh, the type or the edge relationship, for example, from B to A, right? And the advantage of an edge is to compare it to a matrix that it can save us a lot of you know, computational cost, right? If our network is huge, then uh, you know for its adjacency uh, matrix, it consumes a way more memory. But for if you convert it into an address, then it will save you a lot of memory. All right. But there is also a disadvantage associated with it. That is, if you just use an address instead of a adjacency matrix, then isolate nodes will not appear in the the address. That means. Whenever you use edge list, you should always use it in conjunction with the node list so that you can have, a, you, you don't miss out the, uh, the isolates, right? So that's, uh, that's the way we uh, represent a network. All right, so, so here are the basic elements. All right, so first, first element is about the paths, all right? So paths is, uh, you can consider the, the way that a node connects to the other. Right, with with the condition that all the nodes or passive or uh, linkage cannot be repeated. All right, so this is a pass, right? And there might exist multiple paths between any two nodes, right? And usually, usually we care about the so-called shortest pass, the shortest pass. All right. So for example, in this case, there are right, like uh, we we show two passes between node three and six, but we should notice that the red pass is the so-called shortest pass between them, right? And the length of the shortest pass between any two nodes is called distance or geodesic distance, right? So notice that usually in network analysis, when we say distance, we are referring to the distance of the so-called shortest pass, all right? So that's geodesic distance. And for the network level, we have another concept called diameter, all right? So diameter is basically the longest geodesic pass in the network, all right? So that's a uh, diameter, all right? So basically diameter could be used as an indicator, for example, how well a network is connected. If your diameter is like, it's not large, right? That means, that means 
at at the maximum one node to reach another another node does not consume uh too much um or does not take too much distance all right so uh the second element is called reachability and uh, connectivity. All right. So node I is called reachable to node J if there exists at least one pass between them, right? I mean, that's straightforward, right? And a, a network is called connected if every node is reachable to every other node. So for example, in these two cases, right? we are very clear that this one is a connected network, whereas the other is disconnected, right? And so here comes to another uh, concept called component, right? So a component is a set of nodes, each of which is reachable to the other. So for the connected network, in this case, there is one component, right? And for this case, there are two components, right? So it's very natural that we should know a connected network has only one component, while for a disconnected one, there are at least two or even more components. All right. So in this sense, the number of components of a network can also tell us how well it is connected, right? So if you, you have a network has that has a lot of components, then you should notice that it is a fragmented network, right? All right. So so uh, let's uh, discuss this question, right? This argument, basically, here I argue that in a social network, there is usually just one large component. And uh, what do you think? Is it correct or not? And why? Right, I'm asking this question just to uh, keep you from sleeping, right? So feel free to, uh, to, uh, to provide or to share your, your thoughts about this. So, so do you think it's true that in a social network, there's usually just one large component? Any thoughts? If no, then uh, maybe uh, Zhang can address this <laughs> question <laughs> since you have the mic. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank, thank you for uh, uh, being so supportive, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I think I, I still cannot hear you very clearly. So I have just, uh, yeah, I'll just uh, directly, uh, let's, let's just move on, right? So I think the answer should be yes. So this is a very, a, a, a very famous fig figure, right? For, for people who are familiar with network analysis, this is a study on the like political brokers uh, in the US. Right, I think the 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 blue part represents the uh the liberal, uh, person, whereas the the red one represents the the conservative persons, right? So why why this argument is always true, is it is because that if you have you have two large components, then what it takes to make them become one component is just one link between any of these two nodes, right? So I mean that happened quite naturally in the society that means in a social network right it is almost impossible that all the conservative people do not have any connection with all the uh, liberal people right so as long as there is at least one link between one conservative and one liberal person then the two components become one component right so it is i think it's always true that in social network there is just one large component which we call giant component, all right? Okay. And here comes another um, indicator of how well connected a network is. So this one we call density, right? Network density is a network level measurement. So how it was calculated? Basically, here's, here's the uh, calculation, right? So we first need to compute the maximum possible number of edges in a graph, all right? So for example, if there are four nodes in a graph, 
then how many maximum possible uh, number, what is the maximum possible number of edges? It should be six, right? And so it's like n times n minus one divided by two, right? And the way we calculate density called rho is simply by using the, uh, the actual number of edges, so-called the observed edges, to be divided by the maximum possible number of edges. All right. So it should be straightforward that the greater the, the, the value of rho, the denser the network. Or you can call the, you can say the better connected this network, right? So the, the range of rho range from zero to one. If it's zero, it is called empty network. And if it is one, it is called complete network. So if it is a complete network, that means every node is connected to every node in the network, right? So that's the density. Again, it's an indicator of how well a network is connected. And another element is called transitivity, all right? So transitivity basically concerns the triadic relations. And let me give you an example. So if node A, or if, if node one and node two know each other, right? And node two and node three knows each other as well, then if node three and node one know each other, then we can say that the relationship is transitive. That means uh, in plain language, that means my friends' friends, they are friends of each other, right? So it, it's called transitive. That means our relationship is transitive, all right? So transitivity is used to usually measure the level of clustering of your social relations, right? So the more your friends knowing each other, that means the more cluster your social relationship is, right? Because everyone knows everyone. You you have uh, you are all belonging to a so-called uh, strongly connected cliques or clusters, right? So the way to compute the transitivity or some call it clustering coefficient is very uh, intuitive. It's simply doing by doing the counting of the uh, you know the number of triangles. So you just use the cross tri number of cross triangles to be divided by the number of triangles. All right. So um, here is a, a, a another question, right? So knowing that we uh, compute transitivity by counting the number of triangles, then let's answer these questions, right? So first, note five here, um, the first question is how many triangles node five has? You can answer, you can provide an answer maybe in the chat box. And the second answer is relatively easier, right? Is that how many of them are closed triangles? So in this, in this picture, there is only one, right? There is only one closed triangles. But how many triangles in total node five has? Uh, maybe I can give you like 10 seconds. And you can feel free to like uh, type your answer in the uh, chat box. Let me do the counting, right? So this is one, right? And this and this one is two, and then three, four, and five. So uh, is it five? Of course not, right? We have like no five, two, and six. So this is another triangle, right? And note two and eight, this is another triangle, etc. Right. So um yes, yes, I think a lot of you actually provide uh correct answer. The correct answer should be 10. Yeah, should be 10. All right. I think uh Ian just provide a uh yeah, a correct way of computation. All right, so so Knowing the uh the denominator and, and the numerator, right? Then we can know that the transitivity of node five is actually one tenth or, or zero point one, right? And so this is transitivity. And if you compute transitivity for all the nodes and then take the average, then you get the so-called average transitivity of your network. All right. So it's a, so, so notice that for transitivity, we have a local level measure 
And we also have a so-called global level measure, which is the network level transitivity. It's simply the average transitivity of the transitivity scores of all the nodes in this network. All right. So, so, so basically that's the part for the network level measures. And, and then we also have some um, node level matrix. So the, 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 I think this concept most of you should be very familiar with, right? Centrality, right? So centrality basically measures who is most central, important, or influential in a network, right? So uh, the simplest one is called degree centrality, right? Degree centrality is simply uh, computed by counting the number of edges, right? For example, for node five, one, two, three, four, five, right? So the degree is five. It's that simple, right? And of course, this is for undirected network. And if you have a directed network, then you also have in degree and out degree, right? That's degree centrality. And usually you can normalize it. We can normalize it. But this is not a must, right? And another way to uh, consider centrality is not about the number of connections. It's about, you know, the, the uh, level of being a, or the extent of being a broker or the possibility of being a, you know, a bridge between any other two parties, right? So remember, we just talked about the shortest path, right? So uh, here is how we compute between this. It's simply, it's simply computed by counting, you know, how many times a node lies in between the shortest path of any other two nodes in this network divided by you know, the total number of shortest paths. All right, so basically what it, uh, what it tells us is the likelihood of a node being a so-called broker, right? So uh, yeah, I think you should have read the, uh, at least like Granovators, the strengths of weak ties and Ronald Burst, like uh, brokerage or structural hole, right? So, so basically this, uh, um, measurement measures the extent to which a node can be a broker. That means the, the more likely this node lies in between the shortest paths between any other two nodes in this network, then the more likely he or she will be a broker or a gatekeeper. All right, so this is between the centrality. And uh, we also have another indicator called closeness centrality. So other than considering the total number of connection and the likelihood of being a gatekeeper, uh, sometimes people may also care about the, um, the extent to which one, is, one node is closest to any other nodes in this network, right? So it is computed by uh, counting, you know, the, the length, the total length of all the shortest paths between the focal node and all other nodes in this network, all right? So this is Crowley's centrality, but it is not very uh, popular in, at least in communication, uh, due to the following reasons. The first is that uh, usually there is too small variance. It's not very useful for further analysis. And another lethal reason is that this is not appropriate for disconnected networks, all right? So, so suppose that now we, we are dealing with this network where node six is an isolate, meaning that this network is disconnected, then how do we compute or how do we even understand the distance between node five and node six, right? It should not be zero, right? Because the smaller the, the closeness, that means the, the more advantages, but if they are disconnected, right? So it should be a uh, positive infinity, right? So we cannot compute this kind of closeness centrality for disconnected networks. And another reason is that it is quite often highly correlated with degree centrality, all right? So uh, usually, I think at least in communication, we, we care less about this uh, closeness centrality, but maybe in other networks such as like transportation network, uh, this one could be important, all right? So that's closeness centrality. And all right, we also have other way to consider the centrality. For example, this one, uh, eigenvector centrality. So basically eigenvector centrality argues that 
the degree centrality of a focal node should depend on the degree centrality of all of its neighbors. All right. I, I, this is a fair uh, assumption, right? Because it's sometimes it is not just how many connections we have, but it's about the so-called quality our connection of our connection or the resources embedded or attached to our connections, right? So this is the, the rationale of the argument of eigenvector centrality. So it believes that, uh, for example, let's use this uh, network to illustrate. So, so X1 means the degree centrality of node one, right? So according to this argument, then X1, that means the degree of uh, node one should depend on the degree of node two and node five, right? Because one is connected to two and five. And the same applies, then the degree of node two should depend on the degree of node one, three, and five, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So at the end, it becomes, you know, a, pro a mathematic problem of solving the systems of, uh, of uh, linear equations, right? So the, uh, the result of so-called the vector that we uh, come up with is the so-called Eigen vector, which we can use them to uh, indicate the so-called Eigen vector centrality of a node, all right? So basically Eigen vector centrality is degree centrality that takes into account your neighbor's degree centrality, all right? So that's Eigen vector centrality. And there are further modifications, of course, all right, so the basic idea of eigenvector centrality is that my centrality is coming from my friend's centrality, but there is a problem. Then what if my friends have a lot of, has a, a lot of friends, right? So for example, if I connected to Trump, which, who is very influential on Twitter, right? Then my eigenvector centrality should be very high, right? Because my neighbor, which is Trump, has a very high degree centrality, right? But the problem is that then Trump itself may have may have a lot of neighbors as well. That means that means the resource or the attention that I can borrow or I can leverage from my neighbor could be diluted, right? So here comes to another algorithm called page rank. So page rank is basically a modified eigenvector centrality, which normalize your centrality by the out degree of your neighbors. All right. So it takes a, you can consider it as taking one step further to modify the so called uh, um, your dependence on your neighbors. All right. So this is page rank. And actually, this is the key algorithm of how Google, you know, rank the uh, the pages. For example, if you search some keywords, then there are some relevant websites, right? But how to decide which website should appear first, right? So it's ba basically based on the page rank. So Google actually record or rank the, uh, the order of the uh, websites by the page rank. It's another type of centrality. You can consider it this way. All right. So I think basically that's it for my uh, quick introduction to the basic elements of the uh, network analysis. And then now, uh, without further ado, let's just uh, start with the practice. All right. So uh, I think uh, all of you should have got the uh, data set, right? I have sent the data set to uh, Zichan earlier. So let's first use the uh, first data set, uh, the, the media connection. All right, so there are 17 news outlets in this data set, right? Which means we have 17 nodes and we are interested in their referencing relationship, right? So here referencing means I can either, you know, provide a link to you or I can either just mention you, right? In my report, right? So as you can see in the edge list, we have different types, like hyperlink or mention, right? But often we can call it referencing relationship. All right. So we have a node list and we also have an edge list. All right. So then how do we construct a network of their referencing relationship and then compute all the elements that I've just introduced, meaning degree between this 
closeness and eigenvector centrality and page strength, of course. And then we can also try to compute the network level matrix, density transitivity diameter. All right. So now let's uh, open our um, R Studio. I think I should share my, stop sharing, and I should share my uh, R Studio instead. All right, so before we uh, start so far, any questions? Before we start our uh, practice? So feel free to type your question in the chat box. Right, because due to the time limit, I think let's just get started with the uh, analysis. All right, so so now you can all see my um my R Studio, right? So first, for those of you who are not familiar with R, then uh, please know that in order to import data to R, then first we need to, you know, uh, set the working directory. All right, set the working directory. So this is the way you see your working directory. And working directory, basically you need to store your um, data into this particular directory, otherwise R cannot import it, right? All right, so I set, set my working directory already. And if you haven't done so, you can use this code, SCTWD, set working directory. All right, so now you have already installed this package, right, the iGraph. So please library it in order to use it. All right. And then now let's uh, read our data set. Okay, so I read my uh, note set as notes. And then uh, my edge list as links, all right? So usually after reading import, or importing the data, then we can kind of explore our data. We can use the hat function in R to take a look at the, uh, the data, right? So it's basically the same as our CSV um, file, right? And we can take a look at the number of nodes and the number of unique IDs. So in this case, they should be the same, right? All 17. And also to take a look at the number of edges and the number of unique edges. So this time, you know, we the numbers of the edges and the unique edges are not the same. So we know that, you know, some may have, some edges are not unique because for example, from node one to node two, we may have different types of edges in this case. Right. So I think the first thing we can do is to collapse multiple links of the same type between the same two nodes. All right. By using this uh this code, an aggregate function in R. So let's see what will happen. Now later I will share the uh, script with you. So no worries. Now I, I think maybe you can just follow with the, uh, like the, 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 the rationale and logic, all right? So after aggregating, so this code basically, you know, I, I've already explained it, explained the code here, right? So basically by running this line of script, I'm collapsing multiple links of the same types between the two same nodes, all right? That means if, if all these conditions wrong to and type are the same, then they will be added up us together. All right. And now, so this is the sub the uh, sub the submission, like the aggregation. All right. And we need to give it a new name. So let's just call it weight. Right. Let's just call it weight. And now let's check again. Then the number of links and number of unique links should be the same. Right, should be the same. Okay, so after cleaning our data, then now we can create a network. So we can construct a network by using the, the, the function in the I graph, right? So there are a lot of functions. As you can see, you can either generate a network from adjacency list or adjacency matrix, or data frame or edge list. So all depends on uh, your data structure, it depends on your data structure, of course. And in this, in this case, because we have a node list and an edge list, 
So I just use a function of graph from data frame, right? So this part, this one is the object that we just create, which is the edge list, right? And this is the node list. So remember, I just mentioned this at the beginning, whenever you use the edge list, then you should also use it in conjunction with the node list, all right? And because it's a directed network, so we indicate that directed equals true, all right? So, um, and if you have any questions about this function, you can use the help function in R Studio, so you can get more detail about this uh this function. All right, but now let's just uh continue. Let's just continue. All right, I think someone asked that if I can directly share this uh R code. So how should I share the uh how can I share the R code to you now? I mean, maybe. Okay, I think I can. Let me try sharing this R code with the uh. Can I can I just uh, drop it in the chat box? Mm -hmm. One second, please. This one, right? Is this one? Yeah, I'm sharing the uh R code in the uh chat box. Can you can you see it? Yes. I think it's it's done. Then maybe you can download it. All right, so let's continue, let's continue. So again, this line of code means that I am constructing a network based on the edge list and the node list that we just store in RStudio, right? All right, so this object, NET, is an object, is the network object that I just created. So let's just take a look at at it, all right. So after using the iGraph to generate a network, then this is what you will get. Okay, so let's see it here. DNW means it is a directed network. If it is an undirected network, then you, it will be UN here, all right. And it has a W at the end, means it's a weighted network. It's a weighted network, all right. And here, 11, uh, 17 means the number of nodes and 49 means the number of uh, edges, all right? And since we import, we construct the network using the, you know, the node list as well. So as you can see, now the network object are actually store a lot of our node attributes, right? So the attributes starting with a V here, V means vertex here, right? That means it is a node level attribute. And if it starts with an E, that means edge, right? That means it is an edge, edge attribute, all right? So now we we are not just having a network of edge and nodes, we are also storing the uh, attributes of nodes and edges into this network object, all right? So, and, and for the rest, they are the specific edges between uh, any pair of nodes, all right? So this is the... Uh, the basic information that we can get from this network object. All right. Then uh, I think the first step when we conduct network analysis is that uh, after constructing the network, then we should remove, you know, we should remove some so-called loops. So loops means node A is connecting to node A itself, right? So this may happen. Um, when you collect your data, but uh, this might not be of interest in our research. So we just, you know, use the simplify function to remove the loops. And sometimes you can remove multiple, multiple types. But in this case, I, I don't want to remove them because in this situation, multiple, we have different types of edges, right? We have mentioned, we have 
hyperlink. So I don't want to remove the multiple ties between two nodes. So I uh, denote it as a false, but I would like to remove the loops. So I, I say it's true, right? It uh, should be yes. So after removing, let's take a look again. So now compared to the first object, now we have one edge less, right? The previous one, we have 49. And this one, we just have 48. That means we are we have already removed one loop. That means a media outlet is mentioning or uh, referencing itself, right? So 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 now that's it. That's the network that we are gonna analyze. So we can easily access our nodes' edges and their attributes by using these simple functions. So e here means the edges, right? So if you 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 type e and indicate that you are or you are looking at the edges of this network, then you, it will show you all the relationship, all the ties. And the same applies to the V function, which means vertices. And we can also uh, see their attributes, right? The, the type, right? The, the, the type of the edges. So it will give us the type of each edge, right? Each time means so some of them are hyperlinked, some of them are mentioned, right? And we can also see the name of these uh, notes, the mid, which is stored as media in our uh, original note list, right? So we can uh, get a, a rough sense. All right, now, so the so that's the basic, uh, right, uh, checking of the uh, network. Now let's uh, come to the analysis part. The analysis part. So to compute the degree, we can simply use the degree function in iGraph. Then it will give us all the degree. All right, and we can also denote that we are particularly interested in either in degree or out degree. And we can also compute the betweenness by using betweenness, right? So this gives us the uh, betweenness centrality of all the nodes. And we can also compute closeness, but oops, no. So why is, why why can can we not uh compute this closeness centrality? Because if you check it, you will find that it is not a connected network, right? So notice that now we are using this the object we are using we are using is the directed network, right? So directed network means that if node A point connects to node B, but node B does not have a connection back to node A, then from A's perspective, it is connected, but from B's perspective, it is not connected, right? So that means, so it's very it's very common that you get so-called disconnected network in the directed network, right? So, so for now, if it is disconnected, Right, force is not connected, then we cannot compute the closeness centrality. We'll deal with it later, right? And we can further compute the eigenvector centrality by using this function, eigen centrality. And because it will uh, result in uh, many components of the output, so we just need to extract this component called vector. So this is the uh, eigenvector centrality of all the nodes, all right? Then, all right, then let's deal with the closeness. So in order to make it computable, then we need to, you know, make it a connected network, right? We can actually, you know, make a directed network become undirected using this function called as dot undirected, right? So here I create a new object called net1, which would be an undirected version of the net, all right? So now let's track it again about the connectivity. Then it becomes true, right? So net one, an undirected network is a, is a connected one. So now you can compute the closeness centrality, all right? So uh, yeah, in addition, in addition, I think some of you might be interested in the weighted degree centrality because Remember that we are using a weighting network, right? So we can actually use this function graph.strength, you know, to this this will give you a weighted degree of all the nodes. All right. And we can also compute the you know page rank. 
right? So this is the page rank centrality of, um, of all the nodes. And of course, we can compute weighted page rank simply by adding one more argument, weights equals, you know, the link's weight, right? Then you, you will get the uh, weighted page rank centrality kind of, right? So it's more complicated. So uh, in this practice, you don't have to, you know, I mean, the following exercise, you don't have to use the uh, weighted one, right? So, but I just want to, uh, that's interesting case that some of you might be interested in weighted network, all right? And we can also store what we have just computed in a new object, right, as a data frame. So here I create, I'm creating a new object called my centrality, which would include, which, which would be a data frame that includes all this uh, matrix that I just compute, all right? Then we can take a look. So this will be the data frame, my centrality, which is the one that I just create, right? And it contains all the information of the uh, of the node level measurements, right? And we can sometimes we can we are just interested in those who has high degree centrality, so we can extract some nodes with some conviction. In this case, the conviction is the degree centrality should be larger than ten, right? So this this will be the code that you can use to extract. So there is just one uh, node having a degree centrality greater than 10 in this case, right? So, um, so basically that's it for the uh, node level computation, the basic uh, elements or basic matrix that you may need for your research, right? And after computing all these matrix, I mean, we are doing research, right? So what we care about is is the uh, statistical analysis. It's not just about this kind of description, right? So you can, here I write it here, you can add whatever you compute it back to the node list so, so that they can be used for further statistical analysis, right? So usually I do it in this way because in the node list, you know, we have the, for example, the name and the ID, right? The ID here. And for this, object, the network object that we just created, I can, it also stores the information of the nodes names, right? So this would be the, you know, so-called unit identifier that we can use to link the two data sets, right? Because they are the ID here, we have the node list, we have the ID, and for the, uh, the network object, we can get access to its node name, right? and they are the same. So we can use them as unique identifier to link the two data sets, all right? So uh, for example, if I want to add degree back to my node list, then I can create a new column in the node list, right? So let me just do it in this way. So, so node list, right? This one is, the, is our original data set, right? So, so let's just, for example, create a new a uh, column called degree and make it, for example, NA, then what, what will happen is that now we have a new column in the data set, right, which is called degree, but we assign the NA, uh, the null value to it, right? So, so this is what we can do. We can actually create a new column and then assign value to it. All right, so the value we are gonna assign is the degree centrality computed from this object called net. And how do we allocate the uh, values? We, we can use the simple match function, right? So to match the, the name of the uh, nodes and the ID in the node list, all right? So doing this would enable us to link the two data set. So now, if we take a look again at our data set, then now we have the degree uh, information in our original data set, right? So later you can add whatever you want back to this original data set and then use them for further analysis, right? Usually in our research, we don't just have this uh, simple information in the node list, right? We have a lot of attributes of interest, 
right? So we can use them together for further statistical analysis. Okay, so that's it for the uh for the node level analysis. Then for the network level matrix, right? These are you just usually used for a uh, network description to enable us to have a rough sense of the uh, network, what it looks like, right? So the first concept we have mentioned is density, right? Graph density and transitivity. So notice that this is the so-called global level transitivity, right? the average transitivity level of the network, right? And diameter, and we can also compute the average path length of the network, all right? And interpretation, usually um, we do not interpret that much about the descriptive information unless you have different networks, right? If you have right different networks, then you can compare their network level matrix, right? But still we can know that for transitivity, uh, a uh, point three seven something for transitivity is, I would consider it quite high, right? That means the relationship among these news outlets are quite close, right? They are quite strongly connected to each other in terms of their referencing network, all right? All right, so basically that's it for the uh, network level uh, matrix computation, the basic one, right? And of course we can do some simple visualization, right? So here, I'm just giving you some uh, some hints, I'd say, uh, because usually, um, if you have more complicated network or huge network, then you may you may not want to use R Studio to do visualization. You may use other software such as Gaffy to do that, right? But still, please know that we can also do visualization with R. All right. So here, I define a layout first. Let's see. So notice that in the I graph uh package. There are lots of layouts, as you can see here, right? And if you use other visualization software, then you can find that actually a lot of layouts. Uh, they share a lot of common layouts, such as this one, right? So uh, so you can just try whatever layout you want uh, on your own. So, but now let's just first use this one and prop it. So here I prop the network and here, this defines the size of the uh, the arrow and vertex label equals NA means I'm not showing the label and the layout equals L. L is this layout I just created. And it looks not pretty, right? Not pretty. Then we can, later we can adjust it, right? But now I just want to uh, show you that like, if you use another layout, for example, L2, and then you change the layout here. Because it's a grid layout, so your network will look like this. Grid, like a grid, right? So anyway, so uh, you can try different layouts. And we can, because the first visualization is not pretty, then we can try to adjust it. For example, I think the edge, the arrow size would be too large, right? Then I can uh, make it smaller and I can make the, uh, a little bit curve of the edge, right? So let's take a look at the... So now you sh it should be a bit prettier, right? It should be a bit prettier. And, and of course we can adjust a lot. We can adjust a lot. Uh, for example, we can give them different uh, colors we can get them different colors and we can show the uh, the name of the vertices. All right, here. So now it's a bit pretty here, right? It's a bit pretty here. Now the color of the uh, nodes becomes red. And we also show the, you know, the, the name of the media for each node, right? So uh, I also provide a lot of uh, adjustments, a lot of codes for the uh, the modification of the uh, of the uh, visualization, and I I don't think we uh, we can go through them uh, all of them right now. But I have provided the uh, code uh, for you, so later please try it uh, on your own and feel free to uh, let me know if there are any problems. Right. 
So I think a most common way of uh, visualization is that we want to usually want to adjust the uh the 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 size of the nodes by their degree, right? We can do that in the uh in R Studio as well, right? For example, we create a degree, an object that contains the information of degree, and then we can define the size. We can define the size here, right? And then we plot it. So now, as you can see, the more central nodes appear to be uh, bigger in this visualization, right? And of course, you can adjust your uh, visualization uh, by, by a lot of matrix, not just degree, right? So basically, that's, uh, that's the visualization part. And again, please try it on your own. And I'm not going to uh, go through all of them, all right? So now I think uh, that's it for the first part of the uh, analysis. Then let's continue with the uh, with the network uh, introduction part. So let me just share with you my uh, the screen of my uh, PowerPoint. All right. So so basically we are done with the. Uh, Practice one very quickly, right? Um, later again, please practice by yourself, and and basically we have completed all these tasks. All right. So now let's uh, introduce another type of network, which is called bipartite network or some kind two mode network, right? So for for the for the type of network that we were we were talking about, right? It is I would say common network, right? Or some kind like egocentric. Right, because in those networks, the uh, all the nodes they belong to the same type, right? They are either, for example, people or a media outlets, right? They are they are they are belonging to the same type. But quite often, uh, we have this kind of network. We have this kind of information as well, where the nodes in the network they belong to two different types. For example, the group association network, right? So here, uh, one type of node is the groups or organizations, and the other type of node is the, for example, people, right? So this kind of network is showing us the so-called membership or association with a group or organization, right? So in the network where the nodes uh, have two different types, we call them two mode networks or bipartite network. Bipartite means there are two types. All right, so uh, usually this kind of network indicates, for example, like co-membership, right? And it could be applied to a lot of scenarios, right? It's not just about the co-membership. Sometimes, for example, co-authorship relationship, right? If you can simply change this, the group one, group two to article one, article two, so it will become a co-authorship network, right? And if you are doing media research, then, and th this is, website one, website two, and these are the audiences, right? Then you have the like co-audience, audience ship, right? Or, or some uh, co-consumption, right? Co-media consumption network, or co-exposure network, right? So this could be applied to a lot of scenarios and it is very useful, it is very useful. So let's now try to uh, analyze this kind of network as well, right? So the way of uh, representing it is a bit different, right? from our adjacency matrix, right? Because now, you know, as you can see the column, the column here represents the, uh, this, this, this part, right? The organization, right? And the rows represents the, uh, the, 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 the persons, the persons, right? So if A belongs to group one, group one then here we have an, and one here and otherwise because A does not belong to either group two or group three, right? So the relationship or the membership is zero, right? It's zero. So now let's uh, take a look at the example. So here we have a uh, simple data set for the so-called co-authorship network, right? So as you can see, this is the draw data on so-called the uh, yeah, the raw data that we can get, for example, we are interested in this one, two, three, four, uh, six, in these six articles, right? And we have their authorship information, 
right? We can actually construct it, this matrix, right? So this matrix is called incidence matrix, right? It's not adjacent, it's, it's actually a special uh, format of the adjacency matrix, right? But incidence matrix, in this case, the columns represents the incidence, right? So incidence in this case means our article. And in the previous uh, example, it means the, uh, the group, right? So the column is the incidence, whereas the rows are the uh, individual nodes, right? So uh, here I just, because the, the article name is too, late, too long, so I just uh, use the, you know, the year of publication because they, 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 they are different, right? So I just use this year of public publication to indicate the article. So the 2013 uh, article, right? Uh, the authors include uh, James Coleman, and uh, Stanley Wurzman, right, et cetera, et cetera. So this is called incidence matrix. And we can actually uh, analyze this kind of bipartite network uh, very similarly, all right? So uh, let me show you my, uh, uh, my R studio. All right, now you should be able to uh, see my uh, the window, my R Studio, right? So uh, let's read the second data set, which I have already uh, sent it to uh, the organizers, right? So, so data two, right? So here is the, let's take a look at our data, right? The, the incidence matrix, right? And all right, I think we may simply re remove the first two columns, the author and the initial, because we are not gonna need them, right? Just remember what I just mentioned for the incidence matrix, the columns are the incidence, right? And for the first two columns, they are not incidence. So we can just remove them, right? So now we have the columns as incidence, right? But we also need to, you know, add the, individual nodes information back to the matrix. So let's use this simple function, row names, right? That means we are giving each row a name and the name equals to their, the author's, the author's name, right? So, so let's take a look again. So now we have the uh, row names as their, the author names and we have the other columns as incidents. Right, which is the perfect format for a so-called incidence matrix, right? And notice that in R, by default, what you create like this would be a um would, would not be a matrix, right? So it is actually a data frame, right? So first we need to transform the data frame as a matrix because that would be the matrix format is what the uh, the I graph is expecting, All right? So we use this simple function as dot matrix. And now if we do the uh, judgment again, then it's dot matrix, it becomes true, right? All right, so now you can use this uh, function from I graph, right? graph from incidence matrix, right? This will tell R or tell the I graph that you are inputting a bipartite network, right? So let's take a look here. All right. So now here are the, uh, the, the notations, right? UN is undirected, right? And it has a, you know, B here means bipartite, right? So that means R already knows that this is a bipartite network, right? But uh, for this bipartite network, in order to further analyze them, then we need to, you know, transform the bipartite network as the common network that we are just analyzing, right? So we can actually do that by using this simple function called bipartite projection, bipartite projection, all right? So let's see what will happen. So if you project the bipartite network, then of course you will get two networks, right? The first one is an you know author to author network, right? 
So that means if two authors have co-authored on one article, then they will have a tie, right? So that's an author to author network, right? And you also have another network. So what is this? What does this mean? Right, so what does this mean? So uh, this means the paper to paper network, right? So that means if two papers share some authors, Share an, share an author in common, then the two paper has a linkage, has a has a tie, right? So yeah, I see Ian's question. Yes, so this means the, the paper. So remember that in the analysis to, to simplify because the article names are, are too long. So, so I just use the, the year of publication to uh, indicate the, uh, the articles, right? Because in this case, they all have different years of publication. So, so that, that's the reason I, I use them, right? So, uh, so yeah, so again, just remember that for bipartite network, then after projection, after projection, then we got two networks, right? So in these two networks, their nodes belong to the same type, right? The first network is an author to author network, and the second network is the article to article network. So, so I think this would be, for example, the article to article network, if you change uh, it a little bit, if you change the context a little bit, such as like the, uh, for example, these are the websites, right? And that means to what extent the two websites share the common audience ship, right? And our readership, right? So this would be of interest to many uh, uh, analysts, especially those uh, interested in, you know, um, in practical research, right? And again, so this, the first one is the author to author network. All right, so then after, and then up to this stage, then it is easy or simple to us, right? So you can select uh, whichever network of interest to uh, further analyze it, right? Because now it becomes, both networks are, you know, kind of common type of network, right? So in this case, say if I'm uh, interested in the um, author to author network, right? Then I can just save this network, right? I create a new object called G1. G1 equals to, you know, the bipod, the projection of the bipod, right? Remember P1 here means like two networks, right? So I can simply, uh, select the project one. That means I'm selecting the author to author network. So G1 would be an author to author network. And I can also, of course, select the uh, projection two as well, right? Which gives me a uh, article to article network, right? So up to this stage, then everything becomes, you know, normal to you, right? So you can just go with the analysis. Right, so because these are the common network, either G1 or G2, right? So this is the way we deal with the uh, so-called bipartite network, all right? So let's prop the G1 and take a look at the author to author network. Right now, so we can simply based on this data set, then we can tell some information, for example, who is more uh, central, right? in this uh, network related literature, based on this very limited data set, then James Coleman is quite central, right? So this has a lot of implications, right? Uh, that may, yeah, that may imply that, you know, they are sharing, a, for example, the same line of research, uh, similar research interests, right? They are constructing a body of, of uh, knowledge, right? And whereas, like uh, uh, Duncan was in this, uh, based on this limit data set seems a bit more, you know, disconnected from others, but this, this does not naturally mean a bad thing, right? Sometimes it may mean that they are, do they are doing something innovative. They are doing something different from others, right? So that's the, uh, the quick hints we can get from the, uh, this uh, information, this information.
all right? And of course, we can you know, further save the adjacency matrix or edge list of the network, simply using this uh, function, for example, get adjacency of the G1, then we will get the, you see, this is the adjacency network, adjacency matrix of the, uh, of the, of the network, and we can also get the edge list. Right. And later you may want to uh, save this either adjacency matrix or edge list, which would enable you to do further analysis, right? If you want to analyze the network relationship somewhere else, then you can simply export this um, adjacency matrix or edge list of the network. All right, so basically that's it for the uh, bipolar network. And then, uh, sorry, how many minutes left? How much time do I have? When, when should I stop? Sorry, I, uh, I'm losing my uh, clues. So uh, should I stop at like 2.45 or, 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 or 3 o'clock? Because I prepare another uh, exercise for for our uh, for our class. All right. So so anyway, I think after running the um uh ten minutes left. All right. Okay. So I think ten minutes maybe is uh enough for to some of you, but if it's not sufficient for uh for for any of you, it is fine because this is a uh, practice that I. Uh, prepare for for all of you. So, uh, please, please apply what we just covered to uh to this scenario to this case. All right. So, suppose that you are interested in the collaborative relationship among professors at Hogwarts, right? And you launch a survey, for example, asking this kind of um questions: the name, the gender, research area. And in what year did they join this university? And then ask them to nominate the professors that they have co-authored with. All right. So this would be the like the data structure that uh you gather from the uh the questionnaire, right? So notice that right, these are the in the network sense, these are the so-called node level matrix, right? Name the node, the matrix of the nodes, name, gender, year, and area. And these are the network relationships, right? Co-authored with blah, 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 right? And I think I provide uh, the raw data set to you, right? And I also provided a clean version, which means the node list and the edge list, right? So now please use uh, the data set Yes, I think I can share my PowerPoint, of course. Yep. So uh so please now please uh this is the uh the exercise, right? So please uh use this data set to you know um uh, first compute this um matrix, the density and transitivity, and also report other network level uh matrix. And then after that, please compute the node level matrix. Like centrality, and then use the uh node level matrix that you have computed to uh do some initial analysis, right? For example, to examine whether the uh whether it is a junior or senior professors that would have more centralities. That means that would have more uh co-authorship relationship. All right. So these are the uh. Just, uh, just like the sample questions for any research, right? The basic questions that any research would be uh, interesting. So uh, so please use that data set and the codes that I've provided with you to, um, to, to, to perform analysis and then to try to answer these questions, all right? And again, I think I have for this uh, exercise for the Hogwarts University data set, I've shared three uh, data sets. 
the, the first, I think one of them is the, uh, the raw data, which, which is like the data that you got from your, uh, like your survey, you will collect from the survey. And I also provided, if you take a look at the, um, at the R script at the end regarding this um, exercise, then I, at the first few lines of the exercise, I've provided the codes of, um, let me share my, right, so, Here's my R Studio, right? So for the uh this few the first few lines, I actually providing this codes for you to you know do the data cleaning, right? So to so so this these are the common data uh, structure that we may get from our data collection, right? Then how to transform this kind of uh, data structure into an edge list? So these are the uh, solutions I, I provided for you. We can actually use the reshape function. And if you follow this code, then you will you will get the uh you will find that you can actually transform that structure into the structure of edges, right? But now to save your time, you may you may also choose to directly read the edges and the node list, right? I think I believe these are the two um I have also provided these two data sets for you, the Hogwarts edge list and the notes, right? So to save your time, you can simply read the edge list and the note list. But uh, for these few lines, I just hope that I could help you maybe in the future in your own uh, research, because quite often we don't have the luxury to just get the, you know, the edge list. We need to kind of transform the, or clean the data structure by ourselves. So these are the way to uh, transform your, your kind of normal data structure into an edge list. All right. Okay, so now uh, please do your own hands-on practice and let me know if you have any uh, questions. Right, so I think so we just have a few uh, minutes left. So please uh, quickly start your own um, exercise and let me know if you have any questions. And yeah, I'm sharing my um, PowerPoint, right? I'm sharing my PowerPoint to, to you by this uh, chat box. Try do this.
All right, I, I have shared the uh, slides in the chat box as well. So, so far, any uh, questions? Hello, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, because, yeah, because since uh, according to our time schedule, um, this is so much for the afternoon uh, hands-on workshop. And we have prepared uh, afternoon tea outside. So I think, uh, thank you so much for your talk today. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, since you have already provided all the materials in the chat, um, please download the PowerPoint from the chat, okay? And um, oh, I think there's a uh, one question. Do you want to answer this question before we end the session? Yes. Okay. Let me take a look. Uh, what are the common research topics? Common research topics for network analysis in uh communication field. Common research topics. Uh, I'm not sure if they are common, right? But nowadays, I think in communication research, uh, if you care about the uh, relationship among the users on social media, then there is a lot to do for uh, network analysis, right? Because on social media, there are uh, multiple types of uh, relationships. For example, your, your, your retweet relationship, your mention reply relationship, and your follow, follower and followee relationship. Right, so there are a lot. So nowadays, if you are interested in this kind of you non know, user uh, relationship, then uh, I think it could be one, one topic. And another is like something that like I just mentioned, like for the similar to the bipartisan network, right? I think a lot of uh, scholars also doing research on the so called co exposure network, right? Uh, because um, for communication scholars, we believe that. Uh, you are what you you are what you read, right? So if like two persons, uh, have quite a great extent of uh, commonality in terms of their uh, media consumption, then they must share something in common, right? So we can use that to predict a lot of things. For example, like your political uh orientation, right? Or your your taste, right? Or your like your your consumption behavior, right? And and alternatively, you may also want to uh, establish the relationship among, for example, media outlets. Like I said, if you share a lot of like common readership or common uh, audiences, then that might imply that there must there must uh, something in common between these two media outlets, right? So based on that, a lot of algorithms can be developed. For example, uh, here here media uh, does not just it's not just limited to like websites. You can consider media, for example, as music, right? Then you can actually develop some um, algorithms, recommendation algorithms based on this kind of co-audience ship, right? Because there must be something in common in these two so-called media objects. Either they are like articles or, or, or music or website, video, etc. Right. So I think there are uh, uh we can we can do a lot. Yeah, we can do a lot with neural analysis in communication research. Yeah.